So this week on the pod, we have DJ Snelton. DJ is a guy that I met through social media and through the pitching development community. He is probably best known for his company that he runs alongside Nick Sanzeri called Good Baseball, Ground of Development Baseball. But additionally, he had an incredible transformation going from a major leaguer throwing in the low 90s to most recently touching 100 in game, even beyond that, the lower 100s, and going viral for that clip, getting signed, bouncing around from a few various organizations, most recently being in AAA with the Yankees, and then this season playing in the American Association with the Chicago Dogs, looking to get back into affiliate ball soon. So, Great, great episode. It was a very enjoyable conversation. We dove into the mental aspects of the game, the physical aspects of the game, DJ's background, some of the interesting things that he does when he's not actually playing. And overall, just a really, really fun conversation for anyone looking to get better, looking to explore more on what it actually takes to reach the major league level and then to ultimately touch 100 miles an hour as well as a pitcher and then figure out what that route looks like for you and the various mental aspects of the game um just to be more candid with that but super fun episode um and uh yeah i think you guys will enjoy it just based on the shared perspectives that dj and i have and uh yeah let's dive in all righty so very excited to have um a gentleman that i've connected with over the last probably four five maybe six months um, but he's got quite the interesting story and he is just all around, uh, someone that I enjoy interacting with, enjoy conversing with. It is DJ Snelton. He is, did I say that correctly? I just yeah. Yeah. Sure. DJ Snelton. Yep. Okay, good. Um, cause when I t- sent you the notes, I, I spelled it wrong and I was like, God, and then no, I everybody. It. Everybody does. I remember actually uh, in, my, in my debut, they actually initially got it wrong for a second. It didn't even go on the jersey or anything like that. But someone came up to me and just started profusely apologizing. I was like, I have no idea what you're apologizing for, but I forgive you. And then they explained it. I'm like, oh, dude, 95% of people get that wrong. You're good. Like, don't, yeah. don't worry about it. Yeah, it's the same with me. People confuse the A in my last name for an E. I can totally see that. I, yeah. I think I may have even done that at one point. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm not a fruit. I appreciate it, but <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, man, I'm really excited to chat. You know, I've got a lot of topics that I want to cover, um, but I want to just kind of pass it off to you to start. Just kind of tell, you know, whoever's listening to this, give us kind of like a three minute synopsis. Who are you? When did we get connected? Um, and what are you up to right now? Yeah, absolutely. So I thank you for that introduction, by the way. Um, little bit about myself. I was somebody that got drafted back in 2013 out of college at the University of Minnesota and I spent, you know, five to six years. And if I'm just being completely transparent, um, I, you know, young minded guy thought I had all the answers, always thought that I was smarter than everybody else. And that level of arrogance really kind of sidelined my career in a lot of ways um, in the sense where when I finally did have an opportunity to play at the big league level, um, I was fighting different types of injuries. And I wasn't really at the velocity that I'd always wanted to compete at. So when I got my chance, I didn't necessarily get to showcase my best self. And within six months, I went from being a big leaguer to not having a job, um, going through a couple, excuse me, a couple of different organizations and ended up playing indie ball in 2019, kind of got back into my old groove and then realized that even my old groove wasn't really enough to get my foot back in the door. So as a 27 year old former major leaguer, Um, I realized that some changes had to be made and I ended up working through grasping straws kind of desperately and I'm on Twitter and I see this guy Nick Sinzeri and I decide, you know what, I'm going to reach out to him and, um, you know, if there's anybody that can help me at this point, I just need to be more open minded. I need to be a little bit more humble about this process and realize that, you know what, there's probably a lot more that I can learn and I need to do it in more uncomfortable settings. So I sent him a video about my uh, about my mechanics and he got back to me and he was just very candid and was just like, dude, you are terrible with your legs. Like if you learn how to use your legs even a little bit, you're going to throw a hundred. And I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm unemployed. I'm going back to school, taking 18 credits. I'm, you know, doing, taking odd jobs just to pay for food and to be able to afford tuition. And if this is, you know, I got nothing left to lose. Let's do this. And 
we decided to put the radar gun away and we started working on some mechanical things during this time i was studying to get my certificate in personal training uh my performance enhancement specialist uh my fms certification and uh, csas certifications and you know after two or three months i finally decided to turn the radar gun back on i felt okay but usually not where i'm supposed to be i'm usually a few miles an hour down at that point and i had my old college roommate with me that day and i asked him to hold a pocket radar and instead of being 90 91 like i anticipated i started being 95 96 and i just thought okay well you know probably a fluke and the next week i showed up ended up being 97 to 100 and pitching ninja ended up reaching out and he asked me if he could share it on his personal page rather than flat ground and didn't know what to expect and I think he shared it around like 10 o'clock at night and I went to bed and I woke up the next morning to like six or seven missed calls and texts from different organizations. One of them being the giants who originally had DFA would me. And it just ended up becoming a whirlwind of excitement. I kind of felt like the draft day all over again. But the reason why I tell this story is because I think every player at some point hits a wall rather, you know, whether it's earlier in their careers or when, you know, they're getting to the later stages of their career in terms of just overall age and development. And um, for me, the wall just happened to be at a, at a pretty high level. And I had come to realize during this moment that if I wanted to keep going and keep getting jobs, that I needed to remain in the academic side of this world and keep learning and never shy away from information. And most importantly, don't discredit other people's information because it's just challenging what we may believe. And um, going into this year over year, um, realizing that you can always take away something from somebody at some capacity. Now, whether you personally use it for yourself or if it's just critical food for thought, you know, um, I just, I perceive myself as somebody who went from assuming they had all the answers to now officially believing that I never have all the answers. And I love that because I always feel like every time I grab a baseball, I'm learning something new every day. That was a hell hell of a three minute uh, synopsis right there so right. i appreciate that yeah. but um but yeah and i guess that kind of answered the the question i was going to go into which is you know just talk about your your kind of path to where you're at right now obviously you know sitting upper nines triple digits pretty consistently at this point playing up at up in chicago uh in independent ball in the american association so to shift to kind of where the focus is now because obviously there's plenty of juice left in the tank, right? And so, oh, so uh, yeah, 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 exactly. And so, what is what is really the focus for you? I know that in some of our conversations, it's been strikes, the mental side of the game, which I always seem to touch on in some capacity. And in, in talking to guys, the affiliate level, uh, yeah, whether it's the toll that it takes or whether it's just you know keeping a positive mindset, but, but really where is that focus for you and, and where have you seen some breakthroughs and uh, what direction are you looking to kind of take those things as you move into the latter half of the season? Yeah, of course. And I think that a word that you're going to hear me use a lot today is um, transparency, because again, I think a lot of people always want to put their best foot forward. For me, I kind of want to show the whole picture because um, I think it's really easy for us to clip up videos and only show the really good things and the really bad. And I think anybody that takes a dive or does a Google search on what happened for me this year, um, first half wasn't great. You know, I took a four year hiatus from playing between COVID and then I had Tommy John surgery at the end of 21, that which sidelined me for all of 21 and 22. Um, my focus right now is very much in the mental side of the game because for the last four years, I've essentially been a performance coach, right? And I think there's a lot of guys in this industry that pride themselves on being performance coaches and understanding, you know, optimal movement patterns. I think a lot of us are on the same page when it comes to specific movements that we need to hit. Now, whether we argue how we want to verbalize them or teach them to players might be a different situation. But um, when you get into that realm of coaching and working with players and, you know, being blessed to have the opportunity to work with a lot of guys from all different levels and, you know, different caliber players, um, I think we start to forget and a little bit of piece, a, a little piece of our mental state kind of goes away from the performance side of things. And um, I learned from firsthand experience this year, and that's kind of what good baseball is all about, which is the company that I absolutely run. Um, I think that the lesson to be learned from here is that if you don't take the time to sharpen that blade, it's not like riding a bike. You're not just going to hop back on a field and it's not going to always feel like you, you know, that you never left, especially as you play at the higher levels of the game. So I found myself 
always focusing on physical aspects. And every time something didn't go my way, I would just abandon ship and try to find the next missing piece and what was going on and what can I do in the weight room to make me better? How can I recover better? How can I throw harder? And all of a sudden I look back at things. I was like, you know what? I got what I wanted. I got more strikeouts than innings pitch. That's something new to me in my career. That's great. But you know what? Everything else suffered miserably. And the, that kind of brings me to the focal point of I've been doing a lot more mental reading. I find every opportunity at the field right now to go, hey, you know what? When you're away from the field, when you're in a training facility, when you're doing all those things, that is the right time to kind of, you know, kind of go hammer into nail and do the work on all the physical aspects of the game. But the second you get between those white lines, it's time for you to start focusing on execution. It's time for you to start focusing on how you're going to come back in the next pitch, even if the pitch beforehand was terrible. And most importantly, trusting all the work that you put in. I think that trusting everything that you've done in the last few years, you know, at least in my personal case, is the most important aspect to it all. Because if you don't trust what you're doing, then it all becomes, you know, it just becomes a new point. You're not going to really get anything from all the work that you put in. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, like you said, I think that we're pretty much on the same page when it comes to being able to. And I always use the analogy you use transparency. I use distill. Um, and I don't know if we've discussed mm-hmm. in the past. But I used to work at a distillery um, nice. in 2020. Yeah. That was my COVID job. Sure. And so I've taken a lot of parallels to that because through the distillation process, you're filtering out the BS, you know, yep. and, and I think that that's very, very important because for a guy like yourself, who's, you know, been playing the game at a very high level over the past 10, 15, 20 years for, you know, anybody else in that specific sort of pitching development or baseball development realm, something that's second nature to them. And they could recite with their eyes closed, you know, and, you know, solve the Rubik's cube, backwards behind their back per se for yeah. another guy it's going to be something that's so complex that it makes zero sense at all and i think that you know you've done a great job at sort of blending those concepts um at, you know through a lot of the the self discovery and then obviously the guys that that you and and nick work with i want to do i want to touch on that a little bit like how you and nick initially connected um, because obviously he's done some fantastic work and he just got a pretty, uh, a pretty cool new job as well, uh, yeah. at University of Pacific. So, so when did you guys get connected? What, what is, um, what is your guys kind of like, you know, philosophy and, and how do you guys kind of balance this? Because obviously with you playing and, and him being a, a college pitching coach, um, where does all this sort of like come together and, and how do you guys make it work per se? Absolutely. And, you know, first things first, you know, shout out to Nick. Congratulations to him on getting that job. I was so happy for him when he got that opportunity. He's been working for such a long time to get a coaching job at the Division One level, and it's a perfect fit for him. So I'm really happy to see what he's doing. Um, we first started working together at the end of 2019. So I want to say September of that year, right at the right at the end of the season, because some changes needed to be made. And it started off as, you know, back and forth texts. I took uh, about six weeks off from throwing and then I just got right back into it in November or sorry, October. And um, I just started sending him video day over day. I probably had to annoy the hell out of him, if I'm being honest. I, I sent some videos nonstop because I think athletes that strive to always be better, they borderline obsess over what they're doing day in and day out. There's an obsessive nature when it comes to being an elite athlete. And I wanted to be one of those. Um, so I started sending him videos day in and day out. And it was so frustrating because every time you would go and throw the ball at those beginning phases, it was, that was it. That was the rep. I finally felt what it is that I needed to do. And then you go back and watch the the video and you're like, it's not even close. Like I'm nowhere near where I need to be. And he kept giving me words of encouragement through the process. And, you know, we, we ended up doing this for, you know, four or five months before ultimately signing with Tampa before ultimately COVID kind of sidelined that season. And I had realized in that moment that this was the first time in my life where I had done anything that resembled remote coaching. I was one of those believers that's like, you know what, I need to be in person with this person. I need him to manipulate me manually. But half of being an athlete is self-exploration and understanding how our own bodies work. And the remote aspect of working with Nick kind of gave me that freedom to kind of put everything away for a minute and try to feel things out and really listen to myself. What did my body want to do? And we had realized in this moment that like, I'd never met the guy. 
I had never seen him. You know, we had never, I don't even think we had FaceTime at this moment. And mm. it made me realize that this could work. It, it works for a lot of players. And it's becoming a more common industry for a lot of guys to work through remote training because I'm a big believer that you shouldn't sacrifice wealth of knowledge and the ability to coach it just for the convenience sake of having somebody stand there in person and throw you a ball out of a bucket. Mm. You know what I mean? So I like information is wealth. It's mm -hmm. everything. And guys that strive for more, I always salute them. I never turn them away from a question because you never know. Something might click when you answer that question. You might have the right way to word it. Someone else might have the right way to word it. You might answer it a completely different way from me. It's all about how it clicks, right? So mm -hmm. Nick and I developed this relationship where we realized that we talked the same way, but we just kind of had different perspectives. He talked a lot about... Um, and I'm, I'm kind of going on tangents here, so I apologize. I just love talking about this. <laughs> no worries. Keep uh, going. Um, you know, we, he kind of studied things and his origin, his original thoughts were kind of like, how do hockey players move the, you know, the whole theory of horizontal adduction, abduction, having to push out, you know, laterally in order to propel forward, turn sideways, stand on a thin blade and then rip a slap shot near hundred miles an hour. How do you do that? You probably have to learn how to be really efficient through the middle because everything underneath your feet is not stable, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, and that kind of started piecing things together as I was studying for the, as I was studying for the CPT and PES and that stuff. And our relationship just kept developing. And it went from him showing me things to all of a sudden we started having conversations and I'd start challenging the way that he did things in the sense of like, well, you think of it like this, but what if I thought about it like this? And then we'd hop on a call and I remember, and it's something that we've seen circulate on social media and I'm so glad that it has. I, I never want to be the guy that ever takes credit for anything. But I remember one night I said, hey, I was working with this 14 year old player who's having a really hard time learning the idea of back hip external rotation. And I just told him to hide the hip away from the catcher as long as he can. He called me at like 1.30 in the morning and was like, dude, hide the hip. That is amazing. I'm using that with players. And I swear we were posting that phrase like three times a week on his social media, my social media, because yeah. it was just so simple. And the reason why I'm bringing this really long whirlwind of a conversation back to the question is what we came to realize was that we were both on the same page of we weren't trying to be the smartest person in the room. We weren't trying to out coach the guy to our left and right. You know, we weren't trying to make posts that ultimately get you Jeff fried. If you know what I mean, I know you've been there. <laughs> uh, I think we've all been there and yeah. you know what? any publicity is good publicity, I exactly. guess. Exactly. But, um, the goal wasn't to be the smartest guy in the room for both of us. It was to help players understand a feeling. We're chasing feelings. We're not trying to be science majors. Like treating a 16 year old, like he has a very adept understanding of kinesiology is borderline foolish because he's just going to scratch his head. He's going to feel really bad about the fact that he has no clue what you're talking about. And we both were on the same page of just like, hey, you know what? It's our job to understand the way that the human body works, but it's also our job to help them understand it, even if they can't necessarily relay it or repeat it, rather than telling them like, hey, look, back knee needs to stay stacked over the foot for vertical shin angle. We need the midline to travel for this. And it was just like, you know what? No, hide the hip away from the catcher. Keep the back heel on the ground for as long as you can. You know what I mean? And then when it's time for the heel to peel, fire that back hip and let it peel off the floor organically. Just that, just do that. Mm -hmm. And it'd be so funny because like those most satisfying moments that we get, like Nick and I will always talk and we'll even share some conversations with players back and forth where it's like, dude, he got it today. This guy's going to rip. He's going to throw so hard. Like he's going to be <laughs> so good. Like we get yeah. hyped for our players because it's like, at the end of the day, we're, it's a, it's a baseball community. We're all just trying to help each other. And that's why I loved reaching out to you in the first place, because I loved some of the ways that you were bringing things to the table and challenging food for thought. And that's kind of what all of this is about. So mm -hmm. Nick and mine's relationship was developed off of, we both had a respect for each other. We both were trying to do the same thing, but we were in different corners and we ended up developing this dynamic combination of understanding. And we've been able to be very successful with a lot of people because of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 always so refreshing to just have the against the grain sort of like challenging of traditional beliefs and then also have like the evidence to say like, well, if X, Y and Z is saying that this doesn't work, that's funny because I have four guys that I actually used it with and oh, it worked yeah. great for them. And so yep. it's like it's basically yep. like having the receipt, you know, yep. um, and so that's that's always fun. And I think that. Another point I wanted to make is just 
I made this point in the last podcast that I did with, with John Creel about how crazy it is that in the year 2023, the amount of power within the connections I've created over social media is insane to me. Like yeah. people I would have never connected with. If I didn't start producing content, if I didn't start, you know, we would have never connected. I probably would have never connected with John, some of the other people that I'm going to get on here eventually. Yeah. And it's crazy because of how the minds within like the pitching development community online, just the baseball development community in general, like how many yeah. minds there are out there that, and it's the good and bad of social media. Obviously you have some yeah assholes before the table. like yeah for the yeah. most part there's, like there's, if there's you no can, better term for it yeah right exactly and if you can yeah. and if you can form that kind of like echo chamber of people that are all just very you know very positively minded and just want to move the industry forward in a positive manner use data use tech use the you know conversational skills that we all have in order to just move the needle forward yeah. um you know there is a lot of good in the world still, you know, and, and oh, especially yeah. in the baseball world. So, um, so well, it's, remember, it's just always fun to connect with, with people like that. So. Absolutely. Well, I remember like one of my favorite quotes with, I think it was a Robin Williams quote where he said, the world isn't as dark as you think it is. Just step outside, turn off your TV and look around at your neighbors. It was something like yeah. that. I'm paraphrasing it, yeah. but like, there's something to be said about that. Like I was reading this mental skills book lately called um, called Pound the Stone. So I've been reading a lot of Joshua Metcalf stuff, uh, you know, chop wood, carry water, pound the stone. And one of the things that really stuck with me in that book was there was a there was a quote and it went something along the lines of perspective is the only thing in this world that can dra dramatically change future outcomes without ever changing the facts. Hmm. And that really stuck me in my side because I looked back at the, the first half of the season and realized how dark of a place I really was in. I was choosing to look at the things around me and go, this sucks, that suck, or that sucks, I suck. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I started falling into that sand pit of negative emotions and started changing future outcomes. I was predicting my failures before I even got on the mound because I was in such a negative headspace because I wanted to start making excuses about everything around me when really I needed to be more introspective and look at myself and just go, you know what, this is on me. I need to move mm -hmm. forward. You know, this is yeah. bad. Like take it for what it is, surrender the outcome and keep moving forward. And mm -hmm. it's exactly as you said about um, the pitching community. It's that when guys finally put away ego for a little bit, now there's always ego, but when you put it away and you take an opportunity to be on the same platform rather than trying to claw your way above it and discredit people, that's when you really start networking. That's when you really start respecting the people around you and they start to respect you because we're not trying to threaten each other. We're just trying to learn from each other so that whoever does trust us enough to work with us understands that we are not trying to be the superior person. We are not trying to make you feel inferior. We are trying to give you decades of experience that we have had in our craft and articulate it in a way that is really easy to digest so that we can fast track other people's processes of mm -hmm. development overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that there's going to be more, there's going to be more students becoming teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I love the phrase, you know, I wouldn't get on a plane with a pilot that doesn't fly themselves, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, I think some of the, now there's caveats to that. For an example, I played with the national player of the year, division three national player of the year in 2017. Yeah. I don't think he's going to listen to this, but he was not a guy you're going to find at the field, you know, taking extra reps. He wasn't the guy that was going to like go in there and be on a heavyweight training program. He was just a dog. He was just really yeah. good. Yeah. But it's funny to see that side of things, but then there's also a lot of like great players that become great coaches. There's also some not great players that become great coaches. Mm -hmm. So I think that having that open mindedness, that mindset of like just continuously learning lifelong learner yeah. is, is, is super important. And it allows for you to, to maintain that humility that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, eliminate a little bit of the ego and, and really just find more solutions for guys. But, yeah, absolutely. And I think that I think that one of the most dangerous coaching philosophies that, that you know, that I've come across and I'm, I'm not going to drop any names in this situation is I've seen former players who decide to do lessons work with kids and say, 
when I was throwing really well, I used to do this, or I did this and I was really good. They're not you. You're not them. Mm -hmm. Their body might not work the same way as yours and their brain might not process that information the same way. So there's two sides to every wall, right? Like I look at a wall right here and I only see one side, but on the other side of it might be a completely different process that just doesn't work for me. And for that D3 player, whoever it is, and if they ever listen to this, what's up? How you doing? Um, that might, <laughs> that might've worked drop. for him. Yeah. yeah. That might've worked for him. You know, um, I, I remember one of the things that when I, again, I was younger, I was arrogant. I didn't understand it. So, and I think in baseball, it's really easy to either dismiss it, make fun of it, or completely reject it because you don't understand it, right? And I remember, and I guess I'll name drop in this situation, um, 2019 spring training in Baltimore, I saw Keegan Aiken, and he would nonstop brag about how um, how he would never hit the gym or he would never work out, he'd barely do his arm care, and he'd just go out and dice dudes. And I didn't understand that because I – I felt like if I wasn't in the gym the day before, I was a failure and I've set myself up for failure. And for him, staying fresh and understanding that performance is two sides of a wall. There's physical performance and mental performance. Um, he just chose the other side. He chose the latter. And because I was young and I was stupid, I remember that used to really uh, used to irk me to my core. But looking back at it now, it worked because at the end of the day, you're just trying to and I have a teammate that calls it this. You're just trying to hang donuts, right? You're just trying to put zeros up on the scoreboard and it doesn't matter how you do it. You know, there's so many different ways to throw a baseball. There's so many different pitches out there. And um, there's so many different types of dog when it comes to being on the field that mm -hmm. just because you don't understand it, you don't have to reject it. Yeah. So. I want to, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit here sure. um, and obviously talk about, you know, I want to talk about 2018. Um, I want to talk about, you know, you reaching the pinnacle of the sport. Um, but I think, you know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you're a pretty unique scenario to where you made so many strides, you know, after you actually made it to the big leagues as far as your velo and just stuff, you know, at least from an outsider's look. And like I said, you know, you can add any anecdotes you want to this. Yeah. But what did you take from, you know, the past? four or five years where, you know, you're pitching for the giants in the big leagues. And, and then you have kind of like, you know, the ups and downs, COVID just a lot of things kind of compounding, but you've made significant strides during that time that have garnered a lot of attention. And so what kind of perspective did that give you? What kind of things have you learned, you know, by, playing at the at the peak of the sport and then also being able to kind of look at you know the spot to where you've been at kind of where you're just like you know you're right there you're right at the cusp of it um and then obviously like where you're at now so i think what i think what was so important about that time in 2018 was i faced a couple of lineups where just from the most primal standpoint i looked at the size of some of these guys that were in the box first guys that i faced in the past and became a little self-conscious because I thought that I was putting in the work and doing all these right things. But like, I felt like a boy playing against men at that moment. I wasn't at my best self. Um, I knew that my stuff was suffering because of injuries, but more importantly, I just watched poise. I watched posture. I watched intention with everything that they did. And there were pockets of time in that cup of coffee that I had gotten where I kind of realized I'm like, Oh, even though I might be the same age as some of these guys, they feel light years ahead of me. So I got to get to that mountaintop, the very top of it all, and then went to AAA, and then all of a sudden, just completely different tangent, indie ball, Twitter sphere, Instagram, social media, coaching, back into Major League Spring Training, COVID, alt site, Tommy John surgery, get into all of that. I think that during this window, and I know that I'm not the first person in history to have a, a lapse of time where you don't play and then you get back into the game. Um, I think you really struggle to find your identity um, off the field. And the reason why I bring this up is because until you're okay with yourself as a person, it's really hard to be with, it's really hard to be okay with the person you are on the field. You know, there's just so many things and it's really hard to, you know, distill. Um, mm -hmm. 
who you are as a person versus your identity as a player. And if you can't distinguish those two things, when you start failing on the field, on the field, you start to really feel bad about yourself. And then it starts affecting your work off the field. And then it starts affecting your ability to do things. I was getting to the point where honestly, like I knew that I had bills coming up for like my apartment or where I was living at. And I just was like, I was struggling to pick up the phone and make the payment. And, like, I was just like, I was so upset by everything around me that I needed to learn how to just be okay and be like, you know what? I need to stop saying, what if I am not going to be a big leaguer anymore? I need to start saying, even if I am not a big leaguer anymore, mm-hmm. uh, blank. So to answer your question, there was a physical side of it, but I think the biggest part of it all was emotional process and surrendering future outcomes of what may or may not happen. And learning to be okay with myself and become obsessed with the process of development and falling in love with failing. I, mm-hmm. I fell in love with failing. And when I finally felt something that didn't feel like failing, I almost didn't know how to accept it. So there's this large brewing period of like, okay, I'm here. I'm now the physical person that I want to be. I've rebuilt myself. You know, I, I went on Weight Watchers. I lost 35 pounds. And then I gained it all back by taking absurd amounts of protein and just pushing my tail on the gym. Um, and like, I just, I was doing everything. I was throwing things at the wall. Um, I just, sorry, I get so excited about this conversation. Yeah, because, I love it. I love it. Um, it's not many people get a look into what it is that we do. And mm-hmm. if you fail, it's so easy to go on Twitter and just have somebody comment really mean things about you, but they don't mm-hmm. see everything that brings you up to that moment which is why i feel such a deep level of empathy for olympians because you know they get that shot once every four years and the amount of pressure that they must feel to do that it's just um i'm sorry i'm I'm gonna get back to this point but (laughs) (laughs) i guess shortening it all up and getting rid of my word vomit the biggest things that changed were experience of failure how to accept that failure how to learn from it, how to put yourself in it, accept the fact that you're going to fail over and over and over again until you finally become the person that you feel confident being. And then you can take that to the field, surrender that outcome, and whatever will be, will be. That's the biggest thing that's changed now versus what happened in 2018. I was so worked up as a major leaguer that I, I got so worked up that I didn't eat for like two and a half days because my stomach was knotted up. I felt nauseous all the time. I was so emotionally not okay in that moment. And I don't know if this is the kind of conversation that we wanted to whirl into, but again, <laughs> transparency is key. Mm-hmm. And um, I needed to go through a trial of fire. And the byproduct of that is good baseball, being able to work with other players, helping them guide through them through that process. And while being able to also be an active player at high caliber levels, which kind of creates this niche pocket of like, I get to sometimes say, yeah, this is what I do, but I'm not going to tell you to do that because I do it. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it, I think it gives a level of validity um, to some of the things that we do. But, and, and again, like, I think you know that too, because I know a lot of content you post is you at the field making throws and getting guys out and <laughs> apparently getting behind the plate and doing some awesome things. Oh, yeah. you know? um, oh, yeah. There's nothing better than just living the product of what it is that you do. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, just that, having, was such, that was such a tangent. I need to cut it out. That was great. That was fantastic. And there's definitely some some points you made in there that I want to touch on. One of them being, you know, you talk about somebody making a mean comment or somebody, you know, somebody saying like, oh, like, why are you doing this? Or I don't do this. Or, you know, why does he do that? I think I think the the times that people are making statements like that, it comes from a place of personal insecurity on their end. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that there is also a burden of responsibility for anybody who's going to kind of bear the weight of the negativity because of the things that they've accomplished in the past or the things that they're eventually going to accomplish based on the current work they're putting in, if that makes sense. Oh, that totally makes sense. You know, like having the highs cannot, cannot come without having the lows. And I mean, I think that you see it oftentimes with, you know, people at the pinnacle of their professions. It is very, very much like this. It is never Mm -hmm. going to be like this. But 
I mean, I know personally for me, I wouldn't want to have life any other way. You know, I wouldn't want to have this kind of stagnant at points. Yeah. You know, you just want to like, you know, sit on the deck and, and have dinner and, and, you know, enjoy like some, some downtime, some relaxed time. But I think yeah. that this is what, this is what ultimately, you know, gives you the really cool experiences. This is what gives you the perspective. This is what gives you the opportunity to actually do very extraordinary things. Um, yeah, absolutely. And honestly, building off of that, um, going back to one of the questions you asked about, like what Nick and I do that kind of brings something to the table. Mm -hmm. Um, I was kind of more of the, the tight knit, like getting wound up and aggravated and dropping F bombs on my negative days. And you're talking about the wavelengths of success, failure and performance. Mm -hmm. Um, Nick has probably given me at least like 30 of these. They sit in the center console of my car, but it's these little white wristbands, right? And if you look here, it says stay level. And his whole philosophy is about staying emotionally level through those ups and downs of things. So while I kind of brought that tight knit, like always trying to learn and always trying to do all these crazy things and, you know, ah, let's keep going. He was like mm -hmm. that kind of Cali cool, like, you know, like just, it's all good, man. Like yeah. we'll get it tomorrow. Like bring it back a little bit, stay level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I totally get that. Like it's really hard and there is a burden of and like negativity is inevitably going to show up if you are willing to put yourself in the fire of social media and you are trying to do good it doesn't matter because there's always going to be user 2769428 that's going to tell you that you suck and you should just quit right yeah. and yep. i mean for me it's like it's it's three simple processes now one if they're brave enough to have their name on there I always go to baseball reference and I type in their name just to make sure I know who I'm talking to. <laughs> it's usually going to say, sorry, uh, no results were found. Yeah. And then I start feeling a level of empathy because I'm like, oh, buddy, like you just want to feel important in the situation and you want your voice to be heard. I hear you, buddy. Yeah. But also, yeah. I'm going to post this video of me throwing 100 in a training facility in the dead of winter <laughs> and to probably invalidate what you're going to say because I, like, I used to throw 87 in that moment. Now I throw 100. And I know that sounds so cocky, but the level and the amount of failures that have gone into that process to learn how to do that when I was 28, 29 years old, um, there gets to be a, a level of pride with that. And again, never discredit what anyone's saying, but if they're going to start saying hateful things and they're going to say something about your character or, you know, just talk about your performances, it's usually going to come from a place of insecurity or it's going to come from just wanting to be heard. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and you have to stay emotionally level in those moments you know so yeah. if, whatever you have to do to internally validate yourself and be okay with whatever it is you are promoting out there if you stay consistent with it it was like the first it was like the first bit of advice that nick gave me when i first started good baseball was once you get to that level of putting out knowledge you will be flamed for something they mm -hmm. will tear you apart on something. And that's why I brought up the Jeff Fry thing. I think I shared a drill like two years ago where I was doing a doorway separation drill. And my hand was going this way as I was rotating my hips. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they were calling it like a club dance move. And this looks stupid. And this is terrible for baseball players. And that won't work. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, okay. But two days later, <laughs> I, I think I gained like 3000 followers and I was like, all right, well that didn't feel good, but yeah, it helped, I guess. So thanks. Mm -hmm. But um, I just wish that social media wouldn't get to the point to where we're always trying to discredit each other or make each other look stupid. Like it's, it, it should yeah. just be all love and we should all just be trying to help each other out because we're all just trying to play at the highest level of the game. Right. Yeah. I think, I think one of the things that's somewhat frustrating about it is I think it, I was having this conversation with a couple of friends at dinner the other night, the people that you can respectfully engage with and have differing ideas mm -hmm. those are ultimately going to be the people that you're closest with that you can hold accountable because i was sitting there with three of my really good friends and we were getting into like a serious argument and one of my friends was like why do we always have to do this and i said no 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 like this means that this is good like we have so much in common with, with one another that we literally need to look for things to disagree on actively. And yeah. I think that sometimes that's like, you know, when I was when I was down in Charlotte working, like we would get into the dumbest debates because we all had very similar ideas around training and baseball. And we all had similar experiences. We were so much alike. Yeah. That 
it would be two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon and we would be doing like the, I don't know if you watch the office, but oh, like yeah. the, you know, the, the, um, I think it was Hillary Swank, like the, is she hot or not debate? Yeah. Like we would literally be doing like something like that. Um, and I think that the thing that for, to bring this back to the original point, um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the things that I put out sometimes like a friend of mine or somebody will comment back with a counterpoint and say like, I like this, but you know, and it's just like a very respectful engagement. And then like, I can call them on the phone. They'd be like, you know, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> like, you know, we'll yeah. just like, kind of like poke each other about it. But the people that comment on a video of an athlete doing something cool, making progress, doing a drill, a guy doing a drill or some kind of warm up routine, doesn't matter what it is. And they yeah. say, this is wrong. And I realized after a couple of guys commented that back, instead of getting angry and seeing red, and trying to provide basis for why it's actually right all i needed to do was reply back and say what is wrong about it and the argument's over because 99 times they can't tell you exactly what's wrong with it they just yeah, want absolutely. to disagree because they're pissed off that somebody else is making guys better and a guy's getting better yeah using new age training ideas absolutely and they're stuck in the you know they're stuck in the 1970s when Guys were smoking cigs in the dugout, I guess. So, I remember, know. I remember talking to um to a scout the year after I got signed, and rest in peace to him. He was an amazing man. His name was Stan Zelensky. He was a scout for the Cubs. Um, you know, I asked him like how difficult the job was a as a scout, and the reason why I'm talking, you'll understand once I'm talking about this. Um, I asked him, you know, what was the most difficult part about it, and he says the most difficult part was that when you're trying to sign a player we are forced more times than not to discredit the athlete. We have to find reasons not to sign guys rather than reasons to sign guys. Because if we make the wrong decision or if we stick our neck out for a player and we think he's going to be the next great thing and all of a sudden he fizzles out, there's a chance we lose our job. Mm -hmm. So it's so much easier in human nature to try and discredit or invalidate somebody's work because it comes off, even though slightly arrogant, it comes off with a level of intelligence. Like you're almost trying to act like you have all the answers, right? And I see it constantly where I think, I think you may have even posted a player and I remember chuckling at it because I think this happened to me a couple of years ago where a guy touches 90 for the first time in his life. It is a huge congratulations and a peak moment. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you threw it backwards 90 miles an hour. <laughs> Less than 1% of baseball players touch 90 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, it was not a strike that probably wasn't the focus on your high intent velocity day. Right. right. And there is a right time and a wrong time to taper into those things. But in that moment, it is a coaching experience. You are trying to break the threshold that very few people actually <laughs> hit. I know we see it all the time on social media. So it looks like 90s, the new norm, but it's still not that common. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's happening more frequently because we're way smarter as players, as athletes, as coaches, we now know how to coach more specific things, but it's still a feat that deserves to be praised. Mm -hmm. And it is a shame when you see 50 kids get on an Instagram page and immediately just start tearing a player apart when all yeah. he's trying to do is be proud of the progress that he's making. And mm -hmm. that's, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. It is all about making yourself 1% better day over day over day. Yeah. So that's just, it's a shame. It's a shame. Yeah. Because you just want people to be supportive. Your uh, your recent post, I guess it was like last night, um, of you hitting the eighty six or eighty seven on a knee. Um, oh yeah, I've I've seen so many comments of guys doing like lower half constraint drills, yeah. and the comments are just like, "There's no stride. You're never gonna throw like this in a game." <laughs> and every time I see it, I crack up because it's so funny. Like literally oh, any yeah. any like any any new drill like any it's not even a new drill i mean people have been throwing off off one knee for a while Ever. i had a post about craig kimbrell how craig kimbrell that was like his big velo unlock yeah you know, he, he broke his foot that's like one of the my favorite stories of a guy like having some crazy development like literally went yeah. from 86 to 98 because yeah. he broke his foot carrying a slab and then he started long tossing he got up to like 300 feet long toss on a on on one knee which is crazy that is um, actually that's actually an incredible feat to throw something 300 feet from your from your knees 
Yeah. That's pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I love constraint variations. I love forcing the body to self-organize. As long as people come to the, you know, they come to the field or they come to the training facility and they understand, like, if we're telling you to throw from one knee, it's not because we're just trying to make you look silly. There's a method to the madness. And mm -hmm. in that specific situation, you're just constraining the lower half so that it can't really do anything so that the body naturally self organizes and it learns how to compress its arm action in order to create, you know, more efficient layback and more external rotation. And, you know, ultimately just also add a level of violence to the equation that you can't do five to six days a week. It allows you mm -hmm. to kind of turn that part of your brain on and go hard without adding that necessary stress. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I love it. I'm a big fan. Was that something, um, because I noticed in your older clips, you did have that longer arm action. Yeah. And when you, when you had that big jump, you had a little bit more of that, you know, that shortened kind of vogue. When I shortened my arm action, everybody on my team was like, dude, you look like the guardians because everyone in Cleveland once, you know, in 2016, 2017 had the shorter arm action. Yep. I had one of my buddies that, you know, he had the longer arm action, got drafted by the then Indians, now the guardians that immediately they shortened him up. So what, uh, what did that process look like for you? Do you credit that as something that, that like was a big piece of the equation for you? Um, I think that it definitely has something to do with it. It's funny because this is kind of like that what came first, the chicken or the egg type situation where mm -hmm. I spent years with my brother training in a facility, trying to compress my arm action. And I would just day in and day out, you know, make like catchers pop up throws or throwing for my knees and things like that. And then I would stand up and it would just get long within three throws immediately again, mm -hmm. even when I was trying to proactively think about it. And I think this is when I kind of became a believer that a lot of what happens north of the belt line or the middle of your body can be influenced by how efficient you are with lower half mechanics and your ability to accept ground force. Because yes. if you aren't moving well from the waist below, the upper half has to stall for time to get into positions. You might get long, but you'll see a lot of those guys get folded, right? But mm -hmm. If you aren't moving well, if you're absorbing force into the ground rather than accepting it and kind of, for lack of better terms, uh, lead leg block, um, I kind of roll my eyes a little bit at that because I think people <laughs> preach it but don't understand what it does or what it means. Um, if you are taking too much time with the lower half to complete its objective or its task, the upper half is going to stall until it is ready to be done. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I actually cleaned up my lower half mechanics, um, I remember my brother saying, dude, this is the best your arm action ever looked. And I was like, I haven't thought about it. Mm. I just haven't. Like, I'm just, I'm hitting the gas pedal a little bit quicker because I'm not taking so much time landing and getting into positions. I'm trying to clear rotation the very second my front foot lands. And as a result, the arm has to be where it has to be in order to generate that type of velocity. So yes, it helped, but it wasn't a direct focus or thought process for me. I, a lot of that, came through self-organization doing constraint throwing drills or throwing from the knees and then moving immediately into um into like rocker drill variations and eliminating that excessive forward pull when i'm trying to start the delivery and mm -hmm. learning to almost rotate in place because when you're throwing from a more static position and there's less momentum involved your body's going to work a little bit differently so um the upper half honestly yes I spent some time working on it, but 90% of my focus was from the belt down. Mm. It's so funny you say that. And it, it, it really shows you that you need to train everything like as a system. Yep. Because for me, a, a big issue throughout my career, and I was never a pitcher. Per, I mean, my junior year of college was the first time I ever stepped onto like a mound mm -hmm. besides high school and like an actual competitive setting. Um, and was able to get up to 91 and looking back at like the mechanics i was like wow knowing what i know now that looks terrible like no lead <laughs> leg super pushy i was always, like you know old pitching coaches were just like you know drive off the rubber get downhill you know climb the arm action no layback and i was just like your classic infielder that had rage against the machine as his walkout and would just come yep. in and try and blow the doors off of every D3 hitter in the country yeah. with all my, you know, 87 to 89. Um, and 
for me, the lower half was always like a big struggle because if that felt out of sync, everything went. And then yeah. it was always kind of like my sticking point to where like if things were good, the lower half looked good. If it if things were bad, like everything was out of sync. That made the arm late. The arm action was always kind of stabby, but it was always like generally on time. But mm -hmm. then when I went through the process of trying to clean up my own arm action, which like opened up so many portals for me coaching wise, because it was a complete mental thing, you know, yeah. just, and I've told the story before of me just like picking up a catcher's mitt and like the first position I ever played in baseball was catcher. Mm -hmm. and so it was like a full circle moment, the cleaning up of the arm action in the upper half, I went back and looked at video, like the first throws I ever made and the lower half looked more immaculate than it ever had and yeah. it was literally like i'm not thinking about anything with my lower half and it cleaned up as a result of just this one change at a completely separate piece of the body yeah and so i think that when guys can yes constraints are a great thing but i think if you hyper focus on like one piece of the delivery too much and you forget that we're a very dynamic complex organism and yep. everything communicates with one another and you're like, man, I'm still not making progress. And yeah. it's just like, have you tried getting away from the one specific issue and just addressing everything as a whole? And yeah. oftentimes I think that, that gives guys 10 times the progress that they'd ever get from any kind of plyo drill or any kind of, you know, constraint variation that they'd be just, you know, ripping plyos into a wall and they pick up a five ounce and have to get onto a mound and everything goes to shit. So yeah, for sure. And I think, I think a big part of that equation is like, and I know that with our, with our company, uh, good baseball, it stands for ground up development. Um, there's usually a focus from the ground up, obviously, but I think it's really important to understand the individual and realize that sometimes you need to start, you know, from the top down because you just, you're trying to figure out where the disconnect is for a lot of these players. And sometimes it's an inverse thought process where if the lower half looks really bad, or if it's not doing what it needs to do, it could be because of what's happening up North. Sometimes it could just be that you don't understand lower half mechanics. And sometimes your lower half might not be operating well because your upper half is stalling for time. So mm -hmm. where is the body spending too much focus? Where is your mental state going? And I've even had players where um, in some rare cases, I will actually talk to them about their head posture, about when they're coming set, how far forward is their neck protruding? Are they leaning and falling backwards? Are they going to fall into posterior tilt or collapse into interior tilt? And sometimes just telling them to like, hey, you know what? Try to keep that chin directly in line over the, over your hips rather than falling forward this way. Just something as simple as that. All of a sudden, they're like, I felt so good today. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, well, yeah. Did you know that the human head weighs eight pounds? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, yeah. like if, you're, if you have eight pounds of force pulling yourself this way, it actually feels like 40 pounds of force. Mm -hmm. And your body is now just in a constant state of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um it's just in a constant state of compensation. It's trying to self-organize and find a new way to create a balance point while you're falling forward this way. So sometimes you just have to like, all right, fine. Yeah. Your, your, your legs aren't working very well. Let's table that for a second. Let's see what's mm -hmm. happening here. Now let's move back down. Is it still bad? Okay. Well then maybe that is the primary focus, but a lot of this is trial and error. We're trying to expedite this process of helping guys make these, you know, incremental 1% gains over time so that three to six months from now, they're a completely different dude. And they look back at it and they're like, whoa, the transformation is crazy. I thought I was failing all this time, but now look at where we're at versus where we were in the past. Mm -hmm. So sometimes yeah. it's just important to go north to south rather than from the 100%. ground up. 100%. Yeah. Whether it, whether it is a, a physical aspect with the header or more of a mental aspect as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and we could we could sit here and talk about, you know, training philosophy all day and i'm sure oh, this won't be the I'm sure this won't be the last time that we we discuss um you know but i do want to dive into to you more personally and just talk about you know i, I i'm gonna i'm gonna bring up the band i want to talk about <laughs> it because I, I watched the podcast you did with uh, a gentleman you met in hawaii i guess oh yeah bob yeah, I love yeah. Bob. He's a great dude. Yeah, yeah Bob Abbott. Yeah, yeah. He's so. like the he's like the voice of Kona essentially. Yeah, he uh, nice. he broadcasts a lot of the major Ironman events. Uh, very loved and respected in that community. And it turns out for a couple of brief years, he actually worked in the small town that I'm from. So we immediately bonded over that. That was really nice. cool. Nice. Yeah. So I'll uh, I'll link that uh, that episode because he he definitely dives more into like you know your come up and and you know everything that you've kind of got going on personally, but I want to, I want to talk about, you know, 
what makes you different what makes you you know a human being not just a baseball player yeah of course. um some of the interests you have off the field what do you do you know let's let's talk about the band what instruments are we ripping what kind of music are we playing and then what are some other things that you do to kind of just step away from the game and, and give yourself a little mental mental reset so i've played music i've played guitar since probably fifth grade my brother started playing right around that time and anything that my brother did i was very impressionate and i wanted to do everything my brother did and i'm probably going to get laughed at for this one a little bit but i just wanted to be good enough at guitar to learn how to play creed and once i started actually playing some creed riffs um i realized how much i actually enjoyed it and I just kept playing and then I started singing, but I had a lot of social anxiety growing up. So I would only like play and sing in front of my really close friends. And then college is kind of where I broke out a little bit. And then all of a sudden I became, um, I became the guy who always had an acoustic in the dorm rooms. And it's funny because like my fiance and I, we, we actually met in college when we were 18 and, you know, through, you know, ships in the night, we eventually came back towards each other and, you know, met back in 2021. And I asked her, I'm like, you know, what did you think about me as a person when I was in college? She's like, oh, we just thought you were the moody John Mayer guy. You know what I mean? Because I knew everybody loved John Mayer on that floor. And I was like, you know what? Yeah. I'm going to play everything that's John Mayer. And yeah. I didn't realize that I was acting so emotional when I did it the whole time. So music has always been a big part of my life. I've played guitar. I learned how to play piano a little bit here and there. I've sang for a very long time. Um, and eventually through just a sequence of events before I had met my fiance, I actually went on a Tinder date with um, this, this person and she invited me to a Christmas party like two years after that date, after I just broke up with my ex. And I was like, guys, like, I, I don't want to meet a bunch of guys that are your friends. Like I just, I, I, I'm not in that headspace right now. And she's like, no, they're all in like eight year relationships. They're great people. You're going to love them. And I ended up going to this guy, Dave's house and he's giving me a tour of his home and, all of a sudden he's like, yeah, and this is my studio, but you know, we'll just don't worry about that. I was like, whoa, studio back up. And he's like, nah, I was like, I was like, no, I was like, cause I play guitar and sing. And he looks at me and goes, oh yeah, man, I'm sure you play Wonderwall really well. And I was like, <laughs> my goal the rest of this night is to get this man drunk and then to let yeah. me to the studio and play. And like, <laughs> finally it's one in the morning, he plays drums and he just looks at me and I was like, Hey man, if you play drums for people, I'll, I'll grab a guitar and play a little bit. And I think the first song that I played was No Such Thing by John Mayer. And he just stops in the middle of it. He goes, you, you can play John Mayer. I was like, yeah. And then we ended up ripping until like four in the morning. And we ended up like jamming like three days a week for a couple months. Uh, what Obviously what happened between me and that person, it wasn't going to work out. But I remember being so scared that I told Dave and our other friend Vince, who's the lead guitarist in that band, Weeknight Syndicate, that we played in. I was like, hey, guys, like. I don't think it's working out between me and Amanda, but like, you guys are awesome. Can we please still be friends? And they like, were joking about it. And they looked at each other and they're like, dude, if it doesn't work out, we're taking you like <laughs> you're coming <laughs> with us. And you know, we've all been really close friends ever since. There are people that's going to stand in our wedding and um, we nonstop talk every day to, you know, or at least we try to reach out as often as we can with each other. We're all doing separate endeavors right now. I think COVID kind of sidelined a lot of our music projects, but we are always constantly sharing music, um, mm -hmm. thoughts, song ideas that we write. And that, that is a huge part of my life is just music. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. My, uh, my acoustics in the case right now. I saw the I have, case. It's the first I, thing I noticed. Yeah. I have yeah. not been playing as much as I should. Um, my, my buddy, Joey, he actually lives right down the street. I've known him since we were three years old. Oh, awesome. played football, baseball together. But he is—he's actually a huge John Mayer guy, and nice. he took me to my first John Mayer show last year. We saw him in D.C. It was the first okay. or the last show that he had before him and all of his bandmates got COVID. They were heading to New York afterwards, mm. and so his drummer got COVID the day before, and so he had to basically revamp his entire show to where it was much more like you know the bluesy rock a lot of electric riffs was it more, more like where the light is kind of where there's a lot of acoustic work and yeah 100 percent, much more yeah. acoustic much more like uh, the tour he's doing now to where it's it's just him just sitting on a stool and and you know playing acoustic and there's really no band behind him and i'm gonna try it. and snag some tickets because he's coming here in october um oh, no. but my first impression of john mayer before you know joey was super into him 
And I was like, John Mayer, like, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, daughters and I'm thinking Mm -hmm. waiting on the world to change, like slow. I'm like, I'm not into it. But then I got super into probably my junior year of college. I got super into Stevie Ray Vaughan. Oh, yeah. And um, and Joey found out and he's like, dude. And he sends me a picture of John Mayer wearing a sleeveless shirt with the SRV tattoo on his left arm. Yeah. And I'm like, like, oh, my gosh. And oh, so yeah. I go in, I find like all of his like, you know, bluesy riffs. I like I I do like a full John Mayer deep dive. And so I've been a stand for probably like two or three years now. <laughs> um, just yeah, absolutely he's, he's love him. And, and he and, you know, I'd be lying if I said that, like in college, my decompression was like coming back and just like playing a little bit of guitar in my room. If I had like mm-hmm. a bad, bad game or a bad day of practice or just a bad day in general, just come back and, you know, play some guitar and uh one of my teammates was super into guitar at the time he was more into like the punk rock it's like green day and oh, um, yeah. less than jake and and everything like that but it's not it's not a phase mom it exactly yeah exactly and yeah. he uh and so i would always send him videos of me playing and stuff and so i was never super consistent with it um mid last year i got pretty good i got to the point to where i could play and sing at the same time nice. um but definitely need to get definitely need to get back into it I, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big country guy. I grew up kind of with a little bit of red uh, on my neck, so, so right. I like, uh, I like Cody Johnson and Chris Stapleton. But uh, sure, yeah. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's great for just you know, just the, the connection between the brain, and the body, playing and singing. But it's just, it's, it's a, it's good to be well rounded as a human, you know. And I think it, it definitely allows for you to have some, some good conversations. And I'm sure that we could definitely have another hour long talking about that as well but uh (laughs) but yeah um but yeah i mean so the music thing what other things are we doing to to try and step away from the game um you know and and your your wife fiance is is, fiance is is she a competitive triathlete uh yeah so she actually she did kona back in october uh she's actually training right now for the chicago marathon on october 8th so nice. she's been pretty deep into that. Um, nice. But I mean, other things, um, I grew up around golf too. My dad was a professional golfer, was an assistant pro at a couple of really high end courses uh, and actually has built, you know, synthetic golf greens and turf for the last 35 years. Um, golf was such a big integral part of our lives growing up, like my brother and I with our dad, obviously, where um My dad actually, there's been a few moments in time where the house that we grew up in actually went viral on like Barstool Sports and Zillow Gone Wild and Golf Digest um, because he had a replica of Hole 17 of TPC Sawgrass in his front yard. So like I'd always tell people like, yeah, you know, we're a golf family. Like we play baseball, but we're a golf family. And people wouldn't really understand what that meant until they would pull into my dad's driveway. And all of a sudden it was like, what's happening here? Yeah. Why is there a par three in the front yard? And I was like. So, and you always get the same questions too, like, oh, so you grew up rich. No, it, it was my dad's midlife crisis. Like some people <laughs> buy nice Corvettes. My dad built a golf green. Yeah. So like that became his baby. And it was funny because he, he his whole life is based around like building turf surfaces for people, but he absolutely refused to make that a turf surface. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of like his deviation away from everything that he's done for the last 45 years when he first built that. And, um, so golf has always been a huge part of our life. Um, I'll be honest. I also play video games too. I think a lot of us like want to decompress and think about nothing. And one of the easiest ways to think about nothing is to stare at a screen that's rapidly flashing images at you. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah. I've done that here and there uh, with some teammates and play various games. Um, but the big thing, I mean, my, uh, I think it goes without saying like my life is baseball I, I love working with guys when I'm not at the field, I'm texting all of them back. I'm trying to think of new ways to help them uh, get better at the game. I'm looking at players programs. I'm paying attention to when people, you know, say that they aren't feeling good or they're having some stiffness. And then I'll go and look at their back history and realize that they've been sleeping horribly or their hydration has been, like, it's just things like that. Like, my my focuses have kind of been centralized around baseball but if i'm forced to say something besides baseball it's definitely music it's golf it's video games it's spending time with my fiance and our new dog tammy who's a five-month-old mini dachshund nice um, so very busy very busy but in a good way very good very good yeah. well dude this has been awesome i've i've super enjoyed this conversation and like i said this will definitely not be the last time because 
there's definitely a lot more rabbit holes, a lot more portals so we can kind of open up here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I guess the last thing I'll say is I'll just kind of like open the floor for you. If you got any plugs, if you want to tell people what you're doing, where they can find you and, um, and, uh, yeah, that'll, that'll wrap us up. Yeah, I think, I think I did a pretty good job for the most part, trying to plug things in very subconsciously to the you did. You did for sure. this podcast through my word vomit. But yeah. <laughs> um, for those that are listening to the very end of this, we're actually really excited. In the next week, we're going to be dropping a few different options at Good Baseball. And we're actually revamping our website a little bit to make that portal a little bit easier for players. Um, I think there's a lot of players that reach out and they want to do the remote coaching and they want to um, – have a program that's fully holistic and focuses on all critical aspects of the games, but there might be a financial duress in that situation. So we're creating multi-tiered options that allow players to maybe, you know, maybe we can't be as hands-on with the individual, but we also don't want them to feel like they're blindly walking into an industry where there's 9 million active high school players. And there's a good chance that at least 20% of them are getting in-person coaching or remote coaching. So we want to level that playing field a little bit. We're going to have some really affordable options for guys moving forward next week. Um, we're also going to be doing like private discord servers, question and answers where players that are signing up for like the mid tier packaging is going to allow them to do like a Q and a segment where we actually log in and it's private for those players so that they can feel a sense of uh, intimacy when it comes to their training development. And we can answer questions that they might be left confused on. Um, we're just really excited to keep, you know, creating quality content and information for players yes we're trying to put programs out there that are you know that cost some sort of money but we're also pushing out free information all the time on our instagram page at good baseball gud baseball um just always give that a follow that's free and we're always trying to answer as many questions as possible and continuously building the the pitching community up Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm excited, man. I'm excited for you guys. I'm excited for Nick. I'm excited for your continued progress throughout the the latter half of the season. Uh, I'm excited to watch some, some university of the Pacific baseball here in the spring as well. Yeah. Me um, too. And, uh, and yeah, we're, we're heading into the back half of the season, a, a big off season ahead. Um, so make sure you follow DJ at his personal accounts and then good baseball obviously has some good stuff going on. So uh, make sure you check them out and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this and uh, yeah, this was awesome. So I appreciate you very much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me get some of that word vomit out there. <laughs> no problem, man. Thank you so much.